Ladies and gentlemen, NASA astronaut and CEO of Fluidity Technologies, Scott Perjinski. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so my name is uh, Scott Perzinski, and it is really a thrill to be here with all of you. Uh, Ambassador Polt, General Frankly, and, and all of the next generation leaders, it's really a thrill for me to continue this relationship with you. Uh, you know, what an incredible legacy that you're going to leave, that you're already beginning to leave around the world. It's uh, a time where we really need you. After hearing you know, Andrew Segrew's very thought-provoking, wonderful talk, uh, you have your work cut out for you. I think that's pretty clear. But uh, um, I come to you uh, from a uh, perspective of having uh, traveled to some of the most uh, demanding environments on and off the planet. And I wanted to share some lessons in leadership as well as teamwork from these various places. So I think what's uh, uh, probably a good way to start is to look at uh, a space selfie, or maybe it's better described as an ussy. Um, and if you really uh, squint at this photograph, I think you can probably see some of the major landmarks of the region, the, the Washington Monument, the, the White House, the, uh, the Capitol, um, Reagan National Airport, and so on. Um, but I think it's, it's a good, good opportunity to also look at perspective. Perspective is relative, and uh, my clicker will work here. Um, Washington, D.C., we have a problem. Let me see if we can fix this here. Uh, could you advance the slide? There we go, okay. Uh, so let's zoom out then a million miles. And this is not some George Lucas uh, CGI kind of animation. This is actually a series of photographs taken from the Deep Space Climate Observer a million miles away from our planet. And imagine if we could zoom out and have a global perspective. Well, true leaders need to have the ability to get down into the weeds, look at the details, but also to zoom out. And so what I wanted to do with you here today is actually share with you my perspective on leadership from a number of different environments. If we could advance, there we go. Um, my perspective from having been to the top of our planet on the summit of Mount Everest, uh, several times up in space, walking in the vacuum of space, underneath our oceans and submersibles uh, to the South Pole, even inside a, an active volcano, which is a, a pretty extraordinary place. And I've gone to these places not uh, for the adventure, but also uh, to uh, advance science and technology to improve the quality of life for all of us. And that's, that's the real driver. So uh, I don't know how many of you follow American football. I know we have leaders from all over the world here. American football is a little funny. The, the ball isn't actually kicked with a foot, even though it's called football. And it doesn't really look like a ball. It looks more like a projectile. But this is American football. And just uh, two days ago, something really extraordinary happened. Um, it's a story of tenacity, incredible resilience, teamwork, and leadership. Um, a team that was behind by an unprecedented 25 points uh, came back in the very last minute of the game, tied it up, and then in overtime, uh, actually won the game. The 51st time that this uh, competition had been competed, the very first time that it, they had ever gone into overtime, and, and no one had ever come back from this kind of uh, a deficit. And this is probably the turning point of the game here, but uh, just an extraordinary, uh, oh, that went a little bit too fast, but uh, um, he had three people covering him, and he still caught the ball. The, the focus on mission, the dedication to the, uh, the team, and also just never giving up. And this is the, the same kind of approach that I've always taken for my missions on and off the planet. And I think it certainly applies to the very daunting challenges that each and every one of you face in your own home countries and the, the things that you've taken on as your own personal challenges. So um, if we could, there we go. So this uh, sharp dressed young man is of course me at, uh, at age uh, five. And uh, you know I, I had a limited uh, supply of enthusiasm and uh, and basically at this point in my life had the ambition to set the very first boot prints down on Mars. Didn't quite work out that way for me. We could advance. There we go. This is what I thought I might be doing later in my life. Uh, um, I had a wonderful career in space that I'll share with you briefly. Um, but it's exciting to think about all the wonderful things that are happening right now uh, in technology in particular. Um, it's not just going to be the five or 600 human beings, government astronauts who have flown in space thus far, but it's going to be hundreds of thousands of people who will fly on, on platforms like Virgin Galactic and SpaceX and Blue Origin and, and Boeing and Orbital ATK and Bigelow Aerospace. And what's really amazing, 
um, here we go, uh, is what this remarkable human being is doing. This is Elon Musk. He's the CEO of Tesla as well as SpaceX. But a few months ago, he, he actually proposed a spaceship that would take 100 people and begin colonizing Mars. How outlandish is that? You know, that we can even start thinking about moving to another planet. But this is a person who's successfully delivered cargo up into the International Space Station, national security uh, satellites up into space, and other commercial launches. And he's got a very real shot at being able to do this within our lifetimes. And so I think, at least from a technology standpoint, there's some really exciting things happening in our world. Certainly we have many social and, and governmental challenges that we need to face, but um, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about our futures as well. I think it's really important to have great role models and to seek out counsel of, of experts, to surround yourself with bright people um, who can give you the, the dissenting opinion and the different viewpoints to build the multidisciplinary teams. Uh, these are the folks that I read about as a kid and really kind of shaped my, my framework in life. I think another thing that's quite important to at least my way of thinking, and I think it's a way to uh, uh, address the, the challenges of the future, is to have a relentless sense of curiosity. And, and um, here we go. So I wanted to take you to a really extraordinary place. This is Masaya Volcano. It's the youngest lava lake in the world. It's uh, about 10 minutes away from the capital city of Nicaragua, Managua. Two million people live here. And I went with a team of scientists and explorers uh, just this past summer to this place. Uh, this is Sam Cosman, the expedition leader, and myself. Um, and we and a, a team of experts installed a, a sensor network around this summit caldera. Why did we do this? Well, the, we have these incredible capabilities now with big data analytics. GE Predix is the, the tool that we're using, as well as drones and, and other technologies to study this environment in great detail and hopefully develop predictive models for eruptive behavior such that we could warn the local populace that it's time to evacuate. This is, this is about to get really serious. And so imagine a world in the not-too-distant future where all of these uh, threat areas uh, could be brought online, not just for a select number of uh, scientists studying a particular volcano, but uh, scientists and even citizen scientists around the world to, to study these and develop their own models. So a very exciting uh, opportunity. My personal mantra uh, as a physician and as an astronaut is all of us fortunate enough to be in healthcare have both an opportunity and an obligation to innovate. And I would, I would stretch this to say this also applies to all of us in public service. I, I consider myself in public service as well. But if we just assume that the way that we've always done things will lead to better results, we're crazy. That's, that's uh, crazy talk. We need to always ask, are there ways in which we can improve the quality of life? Can we improve outcomes? Um, do the assumptions that we currently have still hold? And, and of course, in this dynamic world, they do not. And we need to, to think very carefully about that. So I wanted to take you on a, a really unique expedition that I took with a bunch of, oh, this is advancing on its own, it looks like now. Sometimes it works, sometimes it advances on its own. We'll go back one slide, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, this is a group of NASA scientists who are, have a funny title. They're called astrobiologists. They look for life in the extreme. Because if you can understand how life exists in the most extreme places on our planet, we might be able to identify life on Mars or Europa or other places within our solar system where it might look interesting but may not be uh, uh, duplicative of life that's here on Earth. And so I was added to this expedition quite late in the flow. And I had been to this place called La Concabur Volcano on the border of Chile and Bolivia the year before. And they were going to go up uh, to the, the summit caldera of this lake at about 20,000 feet, a really extreme environment, where the conditions are probably what Mars was like about three and a half billion years ago. And so we're going to be looking for signs of life. And one of the things that uh, we wanted to do also is to characterize this lake to just establish whether or not it was receding with time or growing. And so what they had done the year before is they had taken this uh, inflatable raft, and some poor soul had had to inflate this raft at nearly 20,000 feet or 6,000 meters above sea level, very exhausting work, and then put a diver in the water with a plumb bob and a 
a person in the rowboat with a, a GPS and they're writing down the data and getting quite a crude rendering of what this lake is, is all about. So uh, being someone from the outside, um, I was part of this new multidisciplinary team. They're including me as an astronaut because we're looking at these types of field science campaigns as a way to train future astronauts to go to Mars and, and back to the moon and so on. Um, I asked to uh, maybe present a different way of doing business, uh, coming at it as not a member of their team, but someone who thinks differently. And so what I did, of course, is I went out uh, with a small budget and I built a, a toy boat with uh, a GPS receiver on top and uh, uh, a depth finder on the front of it. And I drove a boat back and forth across this lake. Let's see if I can get this advance. Um, here we are at about 20,000 feet and I'm driving a toy boat. Lots of fun, <laughs> but why did we do this? Well, the, the point being that uh, we're able then to uh, uh, map in incredibly, uh, incredible detail the bottom of this lake. And so I just wanted to, to bring forward the, the notion that it's really important to assemble teams that don't think like us, don't look like us, don't come from the same places, have different academic and, and social backgrounds. And if you do that, you oftentimes can come up with incredible wealth. Of, of ideas and, and solutions. So I've been very fortunate to be part of five space shuttle crews and we don't have a whole lot of time here today uh, to uh, um, talk through all of this, but um, these are my five space shuttle crews and I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about one in particular, one mission in particular. And this is my last mission, uh, STS-120 to the International Space Station. And it was an incredible demonstration of, of leadership and teamwork at its finest. There was consensus building and situational appropriate leadership. And what I mean by that is each one of us on the crew um, was a leader at certain times of, of the mission. I was the lead spacewalker. So when things had to do with spacewalking, people, eyes would turn towards me, but uh, not always. Our, our mission commander is Pam Melroy. She's the uh, only the second female to command a space shuttle mission, a, a wonderful leader in her own right, but she delegated responsibility as appropriate to, uh, to each of us as, as time and, and conditions merited. Sometimes the least experienced person in the room has the best idea, and you should always keep an open ear for a dissenting opinion because it might save your life. So let's see if we can show this launch video here. By law, I have to show a launch video every time I speak. Uh, it's just a lot of fun to, to share what a, a launch is like. Uh, we're in our orange pumpkin suits, uh, and they're bright orange, such that uh, search and rescue crews could identify us in the North Atlantic should we have a problem. But knock wood, uh, we had a, a wonderful uh, ascent up into space. And it's a really, uh, you feel like a kid on Christmas morning or, or whatever major holiday in your, your home country that you celebrate, but it's a, really an extraordinary day to, to think that you're gonna get a chance to go live out your childhood dream and, and launch into space. An extraordinary amount of thrust is going to, to lurch us off of the planet at, at blinding speeds. We go from zero miles an hour to 17,500 miles an hour or 25,000 kilometers an hour, depending on what units you prefer, in just eight and a half minutes. So an incredible sense of acceleration, you're being squeezed back into your seat, lots of noise and vibration, and uh, you realize you're, you're one of the luckiest people alive to get a chance to go do this. Um, we use these white solid rocket motors on the first uh, two minutes of the flight, then they actually separate from the shuttle, and they're lowered down into the uh, uh, the Atlantic Ocean where they're recovered. We recycle, we're socially responsible uh, in the space program. And then continue on uh, the orange external tank there which has liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen uh, creating water. Uh, the, the steam that you see coming out of the back is, is water plume. And we, we attain these incredible rates in just eight and a half minutes. It's like the, uh, the ultimate amusement park ride. Uh, that steepest part of the, the steepest roller coaster you've ever been on, but it lasts for eight and a half minutes. You can advance. This is our destination, the International Space Station. We have a very challenging mission to uh, relocate a large solar ray truss from the top of the space station um, and then install a new module. And we had uh, already conducted three of five spacewalks planned for the mission. Um, and then things really started to go south. And so what I also think is vitally important for leaders, as well as team members, high-functioning team members, is you need to plan for success, yes, but be prepared for failure. Think about what can go wrong, because inevitably 
things will go wrong, and sometimes it's things that you can't even anticipate. In this particular case, if we could advance one, please. There we go. Uh, we had something that we never thought we would face. Oh, now it's going on its own. Uh, back one. The solar panel that you see there on the left of the frame doesn't look as it should. There's a, a gaping hole in, in the wing. And uh, this is something that is very serious for the, the future of the International Space Station. We couldn't fully unfurl this 30-meter uh, long uh, solar wing in its current condition. We had to either go repair this damaged site or go throw away a billion dollar national asset. And so people working around the clock came up with a brilliant plan. Here's uh, my crewmate George Zamka with something that he had prepared on board the space shuttle. Sort of an Apollo 13 moment where engineers had to basically assess all the tools that we had on board the space shuttle and space station complex and allow us to build repairs that we could then go effect uh, out in space. And here's Stephanie Wilson, our lead robotics uh, expert and Dan Tani, who are going to be flying me out to the very tip of the space station further than we'd ever gone before. And as you can see in my helmet mounted camera here, uh, it's a God's eye view. We're, I'm seeing things that people had never seen before. We never traveled this way before. I'm out at the end of a, a 30 meter long or, or 90 foot long robotic boom, taking a 45 minute one way trip out to the tip of the space station to hopefully go do surgery and bring the, the solar panel back to life. But the challenge was that we couldn't turn this solar panel off. It, even in orbital night when we were behind the Earth's shadow, it was still generating lots and lots of electricity. So there was great risk that I could become electrocuted. So all the tools that I operated with had to be specially insulated and had to develop special procedures that we had never tra trained on the ground to install these cufflinks, we called them, but they were about uh, five foot long or a uh, meter and a half long pieces of wire with tabs on either end uh, to bridge the gap of this damage. And lo and behold, it worked beautifully, and we were able to then install and extend this solar panel and uh, continue the assembly of the International Space Station. But certainly one of the, the greatest achievements of the, the shuttle station era, and uh, by far uh, my best day on the job ever. So um, let's see here. Uh, this is the International Space Station after we had undocked, and uh, you can see... Uh, um, the handiwork out at the very tip of the space station on the very left there, and we're actually flying over the Himalayas, which pertains to some of the things we'll talk about later. But um, I think one of the, the things that I derive from this uh, experience in NASA is that humility and willingness to take on dissenting opinion and actually actively seeking it out is so vital to, uh, to success when you're dealing with life-threatening, challenging situations as we face not only in space, but down here on the ground, as you guys know better than anyone. So uh, I also think that it's critically important to, to learn from failure, to take lessons from your own failures as well as others. And so um, I had seen Mount Everest from space and as a climber aspired to one day travel to Mount Everest and see it uh, with my own boot prints. And, and one of the things that I did is I read about all the successes as well as the failures. And one of the great books uh, about Mount Everest is called Into Thin Air by John Krakauer, and I highly recommend you read it if you, if you haven't yet, but a, a real page turner um, that uh, describes the, uh, the challenges of, uh, of summiting the highest point on Earth. And, and so uh, as I learned from reading this book and talking with lots of other climbers is that one of the, uh, the big challenges is you oftentimes arrive on the summit of Mount Everest with three liters of frozen ice on your back, which is completely useless to you. And you really need to be fully hydrated and have your wits about you so that you can make a round trip. It doesn't count unless it's a round trip, of course. Yeah. There are about 250 souls that are still up high on Mount Everest, never to return. So I invented a technology that we're in the process of commercializing at NASA here that uh, allows a climber or anyone who spends a lot of time out in in cold environments to always have access to uh, drinkable water. There's a, uh, a closed feedback heater loop in the drink straw that makes sure that the drink straw will never freeze. And it's also contained inside your, your down suit, always accessible to you. Just reiterating, it does, it's really important to think about the long view. It's not just what uh, happens in the short term, but um, the, the long view. And so here we are. Uh, 
um, looking straight down on Mount Everest as I started to daydream about actually standing on top of the, the mountain that's at the very center of the frame here. Let's take a quick trip up to the top of Mount Everest. It's an extraordinarily beautiful place. If you ever have a chance to trek in, in Nepal or India or, or uh, Pakistan to see some of these incredible mountains, uh, the scale of it is, is extraordinary. The people are wonderful. And uh, I was uh, here in 2008 in, in prime condition. Unfortunately, uh, about day 59 of my expedition, I developed excruciating low back pain. Uh, it was like a, a dagger was being driven into my low spine. Didn't know the cause of it, but I knew that the summit of my dreams was just 24 hours away. I could see it up over my shoulder. And uh, it's, it's really a dilemma to uh, figure out what do you do at this point? Do you risk your summit success? Uh, do you risk your own life? Do you put your other teammates in jeopardy for your, your ambition? You have to place, as, as I think, um, your team above self. Um, and so after some serious deliberation, I concluded that uh, it would be folly for me to continue on any further. So I turned around. Here I am at basically 7,000 meters above sea level, uh, having to, uh, uh, to turn around. Um, it was a really devastating moment for me because uh, I didn't know if I'd ever be able to come back to, to try again on Mount Everest. It, I'd spent $40,000 uh, home equity loan. Uh, it was a very uh, committing uh, uh, sort of thing to, to jump off and go do this and, and of course, uh, left my family for two months to go do this. Um, but I realized that uh, team had to come first. And so thankfully one of my buddies, uh, this is Bob Lowry who actually lives here in Washington, DC, was on the mountain with me. He, he had run out of gas, so to speak, and he decided that he would descend as well. And so every 20 or 30 minutes I'd lay down on the ice and ice my back down and I was able to hobble down to uh, Everest Base Camp eventually. It was, uh, uh, the, this is what I looked like uh, once I got back down uh, Base Camp. Not the best looking guy right there. I, I can be honest with myself. Um, but the following year, after coming back to Houston, having surgery, corrective surgery to fix a, a ruptured disc, I returned to Mount Everest and was able to go up to the top of the mountain with my good buddy, Danu Sherpa here. And uh, one of the, the greatest uh, experiences of my life because the things that come to us the hardest, the things that we have to work uh, upstream against but finally achieve really mean the, the most. And so this is at our, our high camp at about 8,000 meters or 26,000 feet above sea level and through the night we'll climb across this plateau up to the ridge line and finally up to the summit in the middle of the night. And this is what it looks like to actually arrive on top of uh, the highest point on the world. It's a, a very tiny little spot uh, um, with a beautiful uh, golden Buddha enshrined in, uh, in a, a glass case as well as uh, carpeted with these beautiful Tibetan prayer flags. And uh, we arrived at 4 a.m. The sun began to rise at 4.05 in the morning, so I was treated to the equivalent of an orbital sunrise, seeing the, the, the full sunrise uh, with the curvature of the Earth uh, uh, from the top of the world. And it was uh, just an amazing life experience. You can hear the crunching snow beneath my boots, and uh, it's about 25 degrees below zero. Nice balmy day up top. And uh, one of the things that I did, just to wrap up, um, I wanted to pay tribute to those who had inspired me, fallen heroes who had uh, come before me and had paid the ultimate price. And these are Tibetan prayer flags of my own that I had fashioned uh, to honor the crews of Apollo 1, Challenger, Columbia, Soyuz 1, and Soyuz 11. And so these uh, beautiful flags are now on top of Mount Everest. And in the tradition of these flags, through the test of time, the snow, and ice, and sun, they slowly degrade and the, and the prayers are carried to heaven, and so I, I couldn't think of a better way to, uh, to honor them. Uh, and so just uh, in wrapping up here, uh, this is what I, I think I told you. Uh, this is the Cliff Notes version of, of uh, all the things that I've tried to relate. Um, and I think these are basic facets of leadership that you know is innately true, um, and uh, it's my sincerest hope that um, with all the challenges that we face in the world, uh, with the global threats and, and uh, the, the changes that are taking place. Uh, I, I, I won't go into any further detail on that, but you can read between the lines. Um, I hope that uh, our next generation leaders here will uh, uh, you know, basically uh, uh, bring reason and humility 
civility and consensus uh, building you know, back into the world order. And uh, that, that's the message that I'd really like to, to leave with all of you. I wish you all the, the greatest uh, of success and, uh, and Godspeed. Thank you very much.